Thank you, Russell. And it's great to be here from the uttermost parts of the earth, from the place where the internet stopped because it's got nowhere else to go. <laughs> the most remote capital city on the planet. How's that? And somehow, I made it here. Uh, it's great to be with you and looking at sharing with you. Uh, Frank and I have had some uh, exchange of notes and things. We're looking at really what leaders, how we come to grapple with uh, academic excellence and critical thinking and what it means for us to really be uh, involved in the complexity of the world that we find ourselves and what's happening in the churches around us. I'm going to, uh, as a context, really look at the church as a context as part of the studies that I'm uh, going through right now. And we're going to break that more open in the workshop that we're doing as well. I've entitled this uh, Training Hermeneutical Leaders in the 21st Century and looking at being the bridge between the text and the world. Uh, in Ezekiel's time, God called for a man that would stand in the gap. A man that would stand between God and the land. And I believe that God is calling us as leaders uh, assembled here today to take that seriously. What does it mean for us to be people that stand in the gap between what he has revealed to us through his word and the context that we've been learning about this morning, the context of the world that we find ourselves in uh, today? Uh, within the world, the church worldwide, there are many approaches to perhaps this standing in the gap. How do we actually connect God's Word and the world? That's our role. And that's what I want to focus on here. I'm going to just uh, quickly look at four different approaches that people have taken in, in looking at what it means to bridge this gap. Uh, the first one is what I call a, a blueprint approach. Uh, this is a, an approach where church leadership uh, looks at theological ideals or ideas and uh, comes up with their understanding and then goes to a shop and creates this big stamp and stamps their idea onto a context. You get the picture? So we have a great idea, uh, we come up with it, we finish with it, we're not going to let anyone touch it and we're going to stamp that out across any context that we come in contact with. Uh, so that's the blueprint idea. The, the people that are perhaps uh, involved in this, they look at the theology, their idea, their understanding of the Bible, and they apply it to practice no matter what the context. Uh, perhaps they only have a theology degree and not really any contextualization involved there, and perhaps no understanding what it means to uh, put ministry into practice in different contexts. So their idea is saying, this is the right way. And uh, I'm sure at different times we can all, all fall into that trap of looking at that uh, that way. Secondly, the traditional approach. Uh, the traditional approach of church leadership occurs where the practices of the past are continually passed on. So we have an idea and we have practices, we have uh, a way of doing, a bit more than a way of thinking, which was the previous model, a way of doing that there may be an embedded theology that underpins that, but, but what happens is that we have this idea of this is the only way that things happen. And so what is now will become what is coming. So what has been is the same as what is, is the same as what is moving on into the future. Uh, oftentimes, uh, if we're caught in this trap, we might find ourselves being defensive in our eldership or in our leadership. When people are asking difficult questions, questions of context, questions, uh, new situations arise, how do we deal with those things? If we find ourselves being defensive, unable to perhaps open up and dialogue and, and have a conversation about those things, then we might need to understand that we're in more of this traditional, I only have one answer, one approach to things rather than uh, the challenge at that point is to say, do we need to dig deeper and find out what really is our foundation for the way in which we're putting our, our church into action? Uh, so uh, leaders in this position, are, I'm generalising here, so I don't want to offend anyone. The thing it points back at me, because I've been in perhaps each of these positions at different times. but. But often there's not a lot of deep study happens when this, this occurs. There's not a lot of alternative uh, opinions and directions and, and deep understanding 
of ways in which we make decisions about how we understand ourselves as the church and how we express ourselves through the church that takes place. And so this is the only way tends to be the default position. It creates a closed system for those who are into systems theory and a closed system ends in entropy which is not a good uh, situation to find ourselves in. Uh, a lot of cults end up in this uh, situation. Thirdly, we have a more pragmatic and uh, talking about pragmatic situations in North America has a certain sense of irony I'm sure. Uh, the Australian scene is very pragmatic in its approach to church. Everyone goes off down to the local bookshop to find the, the next thing that can help my church. Is that familiar? The next fad or fashion or idea uh, that go, that's going around. And so in this context, we find that the practice uh, is the leader in change. It's not deep thinking. There's a reflection on what's going on around and we gather up the needs of the people and our, our understanding of what is required to attend to the needs of the people. And so that our situation, our context actually takes authority or priority over our deep understanding of scripture. And so a lot of our church leaders, I think today, find themselves in this situation, not having the depth that we would like. And perhaps over the last 20 or 30 years not being a, a real discipling in deeper biblical understanding and theology, the default position is, well, we're just going to find the best way. And so we look around at options that are out there in other churches and we select something to plug and play into our churches. And so leaders in lots of different places, I think, are finding themselves uh, reacting to situations from a pragmatic perspective, looking for the best way to do ministry. I don't know whether that resonates, I'm sure it does in different areas. Uh, rather deep thinking, we, we, we look for what is the best way practically to put things into place. And so theology takes a, sec a back seat to practice. Uh, the fourth one, which is I want to explore with you in, in more depth, both here and in the workshop that, that we run uh, in a couple of days' time, looks at a conversation between in-depth understanding of Bible and theology and an understand of context and the practices that we need to employ to express God's call upon the church. And this uh, I call, we call dynamic or the dynamic prophetic. And we need to have an understanding here that is conversational, that is a two-way dialogue where Bible theology, church practices are in continual conversation with the context. I'm not suggesting that the context has an authority that equates with scripture, but it's an important conversation partner in how we engage the world to bridge the gaps that we're talking about. Uh, leaders here find themselves uh, needing to grapple with both theology, Bible, situation, context and the practices. And uh, the question that we need to ask rather than a statement that we want to make is how do we reflect and serve God faithfully? in this context. And I'll suggest if you like to, uh, to underline that we start here with a question rather than a statement. We actually come to the, to the table of God's ministry as questioning curious people as to what God's call is upon us within the context to be faithful to His Word and to bring that contextually into the situation. So that the, the world of the text and the world of the context actually finds itself in alignment in some way. So that's our goal. What does it mean for us to be conversational partners with God in the world? So what's our first step? I want us to, again, I'm going to put this in the context of the church. I'm going to look at three different dimensions here. I'll put those up so I don't have to press this because I'll forget one or two. Look at the church in three dimensions. I don't know whether you've thought about it like this before. We often think about how to express ourselves as a church. What actions do we employ? What's our purpose, our mission? Where are we going? We may have some understanding of the goal. But I want us to come right back to the essence of the church. Who are we? We talked about this morning. Uh, we start from Genesis 1.27 in the image of God and there is something about the church that follows in that vein that we are called to be the representation 
God's hands and feet in this world. So we need to think about our, ourselves. What, what is the essence of what we're on about? Uh, in ancient times, the treadal, that's not a word, the traditional creedal attributes of one holy Catholic apostolate served for a long time as an understanding of the essence, the essential nature of what it meant to be church. And of course, there's many interpretations of what each one of those words means. The Reformation uh, took those up, uh, really one holy confessing community. Others in more modern times look at the images that we find in Scripture to say the fact that we are the people of God, the body of Christ. And the temple of the Spirit, you know, the Trinitarian uh, influence there. People of God, body of Christ, temple of the Spirit, as unpacking the essential nature of us called to be His representation, His sign, His reconciling body, His people in this place. I don't think we take long enough to think about that. When we gather together as His corporate uh, body, who are we? What is the essential nature of, of the essence of the church? Uh, this is, I use the word indicative of the church. This is who we're called to be. And the church is the reflection, the image, the presence, the sign of God in the world. We do well to take a lot more time to reflect on what it means for us to be for God. As leaders as well as leaders of communities in the world. Building on top of that, we have the expression dimension. This dimension, uh, we're more familiar with, includes broad expression categories that the church undertakes in order to realise the essence, to express who we are. So if we don't know who we are, how do we know what we express it? Is the question here. And it sits between the essence and the eschatological or the future goal that God is calling us heavenward as the holy, pure bride of Christ. And so we need to also understand the goal that we're called towards. The church has its nature. It has its expression elements that we're involved with. We're more familiar with mission, with worship, with preaching and teaching, discipleship, all of those sort of things. So we actually do those things, but do we ground them in who we are and are they directed toward the goal that God has for us? And that, that forms a, a real integral part of our calling as leaders. We get so busy with so many things, but if we don't have something to align ourselves with and to ground ourselves into and to direct our actions toward, we can go anywhere, pragmatically, traditionally, any other way. Uh, so just as a, a very quick example, uh, part of the essence of who we are is that we are one. There is only one church in Christ. An expression of that, only one expression, there are many, would be that we find ourselves moving towards others in humility of service. It's others oriented. And so our expression has an outworking that is grounded in our oneness and moves out to one another and ultimately ends up with us finding ourselves united in Christ around that great throne. And that, that's one particular line that we can think through. As leaders, are we directing the church, or are we grounding the church, and then are we directing the church through our actions in this way? That's one side. That's the church. We also need to look at the world in a similar way. Uh, some of these things, obviously, John's touched on in, in different ways. Um, the world, I'm dividing into three dimensions here. There is an essential worldview. Each particular culture, each particular context, even subcontexts, have a worldview, the way that they see that the world works. And we as leaders need to understand that. Otherwise, we pass the people that we're ministering to like ships in the night. We just don't connect. We have to understand where they are in order for us to have the opportunity and right to minister into their situation. How do the people understand the world that we're dealing with? A worldview comprises the dominant cultural accepted values of any context. And again, Paul Hibbert and his Transforming Worldviews would be a good text to look on at this in a, a deeper way. 
a, a particular uh, dominant aspect of the West is individualism. That we think first self and then our group that we are involved with. So as Christian, when somebody insults a Christian in the West, we don't get too much upset if we're a bystander. But you do that in an Islamic community, you've got the whole community coming down on you because they think community first. So you insult one, you insult all. We have a completely different way of viewing the world. I'm protecting myself. I'm not so good at protecting my wider family, the brothers and sisters that are around me. And so that's part of the essential worldview that we need to understand in whatever context we're in. Contextual expression then is how we actually act this out. So as church we have essence expression. The world has a worldview and then it has the expression of that. How does that play out on a day-to-day -day basis in the marketplace or wherever it is? Uh, for the West, uh, meet my needs, I have my rights, look after number one, are all common expressions of a worldview that has as its heart an individualistic approach. And so we need to be aware that, depending on the context we're in, of course, if you're a communal uh, context, then you have a completely different worldview where the traditions of the tribe may uh, override any individual understanding of the gospel because their allegiance has not shifted from community to Christ. It's a really big issue in those type of contexts. And then, of course, there is the goal that plays out. Uh, the world has its own goals, and from an individualistic perspective, the goals of the world would, would look something like self-advancement or self-fulfillment. Uh, I'm going to make it. And I have a, a determined understanding of what that looks like, to buy into the Australian dream. I always like to get people to articulate what the Australian dream is and see if they really want to buy into that. We have this idea of what that might look like when we're buying into a particular worldview. And of course, there's a, there's a big clash, isn't there? If we, if we think about God's call on the church as a community of God, humble service, all completing Christ, and then the corresponding uh, Western context of worldview uh, contextual expression and goals, there is a huge gap. This is what as leaders we need to be busy with. And we've been busy with uh, setting up conversations that allow us to, um, if we use the broad term of hermeneutics, apply hermeneutics to the whole situation, which includes scripture, but includes another, um, a number of other areas as well. And that's what I want to look at now. There's four areas that uh, I want us to think about hermeneutics more widely than perhaps we would. We often think about it as how do we actually go from the exegesis that we've got down on a piece of paper and uh, bring that across to the world today from a biblical perspective. But I want to look at first that we, we need to consider personal hermeneutics. In other words, we need to understand ourselves. We need to understand what's going on. We need to interpret ourselves. This is a reflection that's focused on our awareness uh, that we are interpreters. We all wear glasses, so when we approach the text, when we think about theology, when we look at a situation, any context, we, we're interpreting it with our own glasses on, from our own contextual expression. And we tend to apply our own ideas into that situation, into the text, into that theological ideal. And so if we don't step back and are able to more carefully objectify who we are and the situation or the text or the theology that we're dealing with, we then just become a conduit for our own presuppositions in our own worldview. And we can end up at the blueprint situation where my ideas are stamped across onto other contexts. So we need to be aware of the presuppositions that we have, the biased tendencies that we often pick up and apply into situations. Uh, interesting text in John 13, 3 to 4, uh, the, the serving, uh, the washing of the disciples' feet, before he goes to that, he says, well the text says, Jesus knew who he was and therefore he got up and served. 
He knew his security as the Son of God. He knew all of who he was. And he found himself in a freedom to both be a servant and to challenge the whole situation that he found himself in. Secondly, we need to look at situational hermeneutics. And John's been busy with contextualization, and that fits in here. Here we ask the question, do I understand the situation? Um, I like to give answers. Someone asks a question, I like to give answers. But I'm learning more and more that my first action should be actually, I need to know more. I need to come from a question in perspective. I need to understand the situation lest I fall into the trap of just putting across my ideas that come from my presuppositions and my worldview. So we need to be people that are first curious rather than presumptuous. And through situational hermeneutics we seek to carefully describe and understand the culture, the context, the details of the story that surrounds what we're dealing with as leaders. And that situation could be inside the text, as well as the situation with people that we're dealing with. Uh, so Jesus comes and approaches the Samaritan woman and, and he has, well we don't have that foreknowledge, the understanding that he has an insight, but it, it's a, we, we understand that he's so aware of the context in how he deals with that situation, that he sees right to the heart of the real issue, not what was presented in the first part of the text in John Chapter 4. Then, of course, we come to biblical hermeneutics that we're much more familiar with. We ask the questions, do I understand scripture? Here we engage with the text, being faithful, considering authorial intent, contextual elements, with a canonical approach. In other words, all of scripture is God on the way with his people. So we understand scripture by interpreting in the, not only the context of the book that we're reading, but also the overall intention that God has for his salvation plan that's moving to the future. And lastly, theological hermeneutics. And as a, a young child growing up and as a teenager and then moving on into adult life and then going to Bible college, I think this was an area that I completely lacked. Um, I was completely ignorant, I would say. And so I obviously grew up in a context, and it was a Christian Brethren context, where I think a biblical understanding was done well. And I liken that to, to looking at a jigsaw. Uh, I think, and uh, I'm, I'm like this as well at times, I think we're really good at picking up pieces of the jigsaw and articulating what they mean. Two or three verses here, a passage there, a section over here. But to actually put the pieces together so that it creates a clear picture. So that we can then again look at the pieces in how they contribute to uh, the overall theme of what God is on about. Of creating a covenant of people that will celebrate eternity with Him forever. For me that was missing. I think as leaders we need to be theologically astute and able to interpret scripture within the broad themes that we understand with conviction. So if we do those four things, and uh, you can enrol in courses at our college to do that in more detail, or you can probably talk to Frank about it. Plenty of other places to go, we haven't got time to do that. We then ask ourselves this question. Where are we headed? Where are we headed? Having undertaken the hermeneutical work, the gap between the Word of God and the world can now be discerned. The gap is defined, we've looked at it in three areas, essence, expression and goal. But here we ask, what is our goal? What is our goal response to the gap? How do we align, this is the question, how do we align the world, the situation, the context we find ourselves under <coughs> The kingdom, rule of God. And so we're in conversation with understanding that we have this situation that the world's in. We understand where the Bible is calling us to. And we develop our ministries to bridge. In a conversation with the world, 
that opens windows where they see God from another perspective. Often what we do is we, we look at God through our window and we ask them to look at God but they don't have that same window to look at God through. We need to find the window that they're looking through on the world so that we can reorient that and include God in the picture. Uh, so we're, what we're looking here is, is, a, is a bigger thing than uh, sometimes we can reduce our ministry to uh, salvation, moral living, decision making for God. But we're talking about our whole world, the way in which we do life, the way in which we understand life, our experience of life as being reoriented and placed under the alignment of God. It's a full life experience. It's not action modification. It's life alignment. Um, I've done a trick here because I've added six under being rich. If you've got my notes, I think you've only got five. What does it mean for us to be this bridge? And I put it be this bridge rather than do the bridge because I want us to go back to who we are as much as what we do. We have to integrate those two together. Firstly, it's reflective. And that calls to mind our personal hermeneutics. We stand as people that must be able to distance ourselves from the ministry enough to review the situation rather than be overcome by it. We must be open to listening, to having our presuppositions and blind spots revealed, and then we're immersed again in ministry, aren't we? Into the brokenness of the world that we find ourselves. Secondly, it's relational. We stand with the people and seek to understand their world, their context, their picture of God if it exists at all. We stand with them. Not over against them, Stamping them with our ideas, but we stand with them first of all. Thirdly, it's prophetic. We boldly yet contextually communicate God's perspective in word, action, and through our presence. It's all of us are involved. We often leave out the indicative in our presentation of the message of what we're on about. And by that I mean we often communicate what needs to happen rather than the why. Are you with me? The, the why is as much important, if perhaps not more important, to communicate than the transformation part of the equation that we often rush to bring. As an example I put here, how many, how many sermons include the need to not commit <coughs> adultery or to not be immoral? compared to those which include a careful presentation of why these commands even exist. <coughs> Does our call for an imperative response come from a greater understanding of the Trinitarian nature of God, of the covenantal love of God, of being created in God's image, of the holiness and the otherness of God, of His relational reconciling work in Christ, and the eschatological goal of us being connected in relationship with God all have a bearing on our understanding of those commands. But so often we rush headlong into you must rather than can you see God's design and why this must be so. Fourthly, it's incarnational. In the midst of the mess of life, and life is messy, we faithfully, lovingly, incarnationally walk with the person pointing them toward God through the word, through life and through loving community. Now if we're to be shepherds of sheep, when you get sheep together, they make a lot of mess. And oftentimes we want to be ministers that keep ourselves clean and away from the mess of life, but we can't. This is an incarnational ministry in Jesus exemplified being involved in the mess of life. Uh, it's communal. We exist as a community. John 13, 34, 35 clearly expresses that our, our communal love for one another is actually missional. It actually shows people who we are disciples of. And so we are to take our God-shaped community into the world. Often our responses 
to God's calling are more individualistic rather than communal. And the last part of the bridge is that we are visionary. We must see ministry from God's perspective. What God wants to do in people, not to judge them for where they are now, but to see them through God's eyes as to how he has created them and desires them to be. So actually viewing ministry through the eyes of God from the goal that he has for each of his creation. Now I know that's a whole lot of stuff. I have two pictures that I hope we've got time to look through that we use in our college as models for having conversational or dynamic uh, bridging of gaps and uh, hopefully this will be helpful to you. The, the notes on this will actually um, be released I think after this so you'll have all that I have in front of me. We call it question the question. When people come up to you and ask dumb questions, there's often things behind the question that if we ask what's behind reveals the situation that's going on for that person. So we ask, what is your presenting question? And then after we get some answer, we say, well, what do you, why do you ask this question? Rather than answering it, which we often tempt to do, why do you ask this question? That little S there says that we're looking at situational hermeneutics there. What is the situation that we're involved in here? The next process is we ask, what are the presuppositions in your question? What are the assumptions? What are the things that you are calling foundational so that you ask this question? Okay. And there we're looking at what's going behind either us if we're interpreting the text or the other person. What's going on for them personally? What's their worldview? We're getting to touch base with some of the things of a deeper understanding. And then we move uh, to what is your real question? So the question may need to be rephrased once we've understood our assumptions, we get a few of those things out of the way. What is the core of what you're on about? The real question, not the presenting question. Then we move to Bible and theology. How does the Bible and theology deal with the real question? So now that we've got the real question, we, we investigate what we can bring into that context to understand uh, God's world in comparison to the questioner's world. After we've understood that, we then go back to the personal situation. How does that affect my understanding, my presuppositions, my assumptions? I need to change at this point. I need to see the world through God's eyes, is what we're saying, rather than through my blinkers. What needs to change for me to see clearly? And then we say, how would you now ask your question? So again, the question is being asked from a God perspective, not from a I perspective, my perspective. So we've incorporated a question into an understanding of what God is doing. And then of course we move on to how would you answer the new question yourself? So actually, if we facilitate a process like this, we don't actually have to do much. We just have to have a good question. But it's leading people in a conversation with God and an understanding of the situation they're in and themselves right through that. Now if we do this for ourselves, then we can understand more about where we're coming from. If we find ourselves asking a deep question, we can go through this and say, what is it that is blocking me from asking the real question? What are my assumptions here are uh, really key at the front of this? And then, of course, we need to end with how does this affect your world, your worldview, and your actions? And then the process will continue because normally we don't change perfectly first time round. We get a nudge, we need more nudging. Okay. That's the continued the continue dialogue. We keep going around and around in a process that leads us from the Word of God to the world of the people and back again, looking to cross the gaps and align the church according to the essence, the expression, 
and the goal that he reveals to us. We unpack those a bit more in the workshop. Can I advertise? Is that allowed? I'm not allowed to get charged for doing that. So. Thank you for listening. All right, let's look at our presentation this morning. I had the privilege of interacting with a few people uh, on my presentation, and I'm thankful for their input. Sometimes I'll refer to them. Uh, my part of the presentation is building academic depth into the Brethren movement. But I want to start with a kind of a historical overview. Let's say it like this. Let's put the, the, the big elephant in the room and then see some of the issues that we have faced in the past. And maybe they are still here. Uh, early Brethren, most of the early Brethren were men of great academic learning. And yet, according to the Buddha, however, they found no reason to pursue formal theological training beyond which might be available in the local assembly. We have a few quotes. I have two here, one from Darby and one from Mackintosh. In your overview, you'll see a few more references to Darby's collected writing and letter. And one of them is uh, where he said, there never was any seminary for missionary, uh, for training missionaries. That's what he said. Uh, and then he said, what I judge to be essential to brethren is the possession of the Holy Ghost on earth. What else do we need if we have the Holy Spirit? But uh, the second generation of leaders seem to have developed a negative attitude toward theological education. And my colleague Mark Stephenson was correct when he wrote, in Macintosh, we see an hostility to formal and systematic theology. And I'm quoting Macintosh in one of his writings. He said, uh, better far to set aside the systems of theology and schools of divinity and come like a little child to the eternal fountain of Holy Scripture and there drink in the living teachings of God's Spirit. Why would we want to go to an academic institution when all we need is just to go to Scripture? After that, you know, we've had a, a period where for many decades, decades there was a hostility towards training institutions. And then we have uh, a, a, the period when we have people studying or entering academic training and theological training and Christian colleges. I wish I had uh, the opportunity to interact with more of you in different contexts on the issues. Uh, but for now, my focus will be on North America, some of the issues that they face in this issue. One of them is with Emmaus uh, College when it started. Uh, Emmaus had to defend the position of starting a Bible training institution because some felt a Bible training institution is not scriptural. So if it's not in the Bible, why do you need it? And uh, Emmaus defended that position by saying in uh, its yearbook, uh, that there is a need to distinguish between scriptural, non-scriptural, and unscriptural. So the Bible College was not unscriptural, even though it's not mentioned in scripture. Why? Because we have Sunday school, daily vacation Bible school, summer Bible camps for children, hospitals, orphanages, Christian magazine. None of those are in scripture, but we have no problem dealing with that. Uh, in the 1950s, it made us, uh, in an article that was published by the leadership of the college in, uh, in the Letters of Interest magazine, uh, they said that they emphasized the fact and re-emphasized it until the students get a bit tired of learning. You did not come here to be made a preacher. And then the then uh, president of the college, uh, William MacDonald, in the 60s, in a letter that he wrote to the trustees of the school, 
emphasized this fact when he said, we do not believe that training at Emmaus qualifies a person for the work of the Lord. Nothing but a distinct commission from the glorified Lord will suffice in this connection. But another discussion took place in uh, 1965 when they proposed a training center in Vancouver, Canada. And it's good to look at the training. I give some of the references of what happened there and the letters they wrote in uh, various magazines discussing whether it was important or necessary to have something like this. Again, some say we need this. Uh, one of them, uh, John uh, Cochrane, he said uh, the emergence of a more academic church congregation was, you know, it is uh, uh, necessary to have more training for our people because our people in the church are better equipped academically. A great number of people who occupy our church pews will possess trained minds and some familiarity with world thought. And then he also said, our theology will have to be related to the world around us and our preachers will have to possess qualification sufficient to command the respect of their audiences. Uh, Arthur Hill, uh, Hill proposed that we do a center of postgraduate theological training in fellowship with Christian brethren. You should have included at the Lord's table. <laughs> but not everybody agreed with this point. August von Rey, for example, said, and then again repeating uh, the argument, uh, because scripture says nothing whatsoever about special advanced training in theology or in the knowledge of the Bible. And then he said, Moses went to the desert to unlearn probably much that he had accumulated in Egypt's court, and Paul went into Arabia and then to his home of Tarsus, not to college for training in God's thought and ways. To this, uh, Davis responded uh, by, by saying, you know, that there is, uh, that the, the idea possessed the great danger of centralization in that the school may become a denominational center. And of course, the history of corruption among such institutions indicated that they were not worth pursuing. But there were not only negative voices against it. There were some people who felt that uh, we really have to uh, go for this. And one of them was uh, Neil Fraser, who, who said that the diligent student at home with this work, could obtain the same education, but he would not have the prestige that goes with his degree from a theological college. Young leather man, as a rule, has no access to colleges to reach students for Christ. Well, others continue to make a case for that. I won't go into the details. You have the point there. And then we move to another discussion. Still about the same issue. Do we need training institutions as brethren? And it was a discussion between uh, Michael Brown and my colleague David McLeod, who was, by the way, my research assistant in helping with some of the uh, things here. I'm sure you will appreciate that I call him that. And in that discussion, we find some of the same things again. Uh, Michael Brown wrote a, a, a little pamphlet called Bible Colleges, and the subtitle was A Warning Against the Spread of Bible Teaching Institutes Among New Testament Assemblies. This book was reprinted in India, and I saw that on the website of the Kerala Brethren there was a debate going on about some of these ideas. But uh, Dr. McLeod uh, discussed and interact with him. There are 10 points. I will not go into detail. I'll just mention some of them. Point number two is where Brown stated, early brethren commence no training institutions. To which uh, Dr. McLeod replied, 
This argument grants an authority to brethren tradition that it should not have. The early brethren were not always right. The third point, uh, his argument was that this institution will uh, diminish the status of local assembly even though we admit that some benefits can be derived from them. McLaughlin responded, Here I can only say that where I have first-hand knowledge, the assemblies that have had men trained in such institution have been strengthened. Point number five, according to Brown, what assembly need was the Holy Spirit's teaching and not academic qualification. Do you see the repetition of Darby's argument and Macintosh's argument? Brown is creating a false dichotomy. There can be spiritual teaching in academic setting. The sixth point, uh, he said, uh, what that God's sovereignty use humble instrument. <coughs> and actually to this point, Dr. McLeod uh, mentioned five things, and then he concluded uh, by saying, all genuine students of the word will acknowledge the help they receive from the lexicons, uh, language tools, church history, systematic theologies, and commentaries in their libraries. The best of these studies today were written, we all know, by men with academic training in their respective disciplines. Uh, I will not continue with this. I think this, the, the, the paper is worth reading the review, and we made it available. Uh, to you in electronic format, some of it that was printed. If your copy is not clear enough, Dr. McCord has a clean copy that he is more than willing to share with you. But I think this is worth continue uh, reading and sharing with people. We really have to make a case for this case. Let's look at some of the questions that will be before us. Philosophical, I say, even pre-philosophical questions. And that is the whole debate about do we need institutions and so Is it just a biblical thing or is it a more deep fundamental question? Who are we? Are we a movement? Are we a denomination? Some people struggle with their identity, even as a brethren, uh, you know, coming from a brethren background. If the identity issue is not answered, it will be difficult to answer other questions as well. Another question is what, with, with, within what framework of thought are we operating? Some will say it is a biblical framework and we see all the things that we try to bring in is trying to be faithful to scripture and actually not realizing that not all that we say is scripture is really scripture. Some of it is just our interpretation and our understanding of it. And I'm quoting William Kelly here who said that readings, translations or expositions which are quite distinct from divine revelation belong solely to man's responsible use of revelation. The two are not the same. Our interpretation our translations, our variant readings are not necessarily the defined revelation. It's our use of it, responsible, sometimes irresponsible use of it. And then the other question that was uh, discussed in detail here already is what is the worldview behind our being and our frame of thought? And then coming to the other part of the presentation is the issue of academic. What is academic? Of course, this is important. Coming from such diverse background, we have to answer this question, since some of us will have a different view on that. Some would say it is theoretical uh, knowledge, not necessarily relevant for the practice. Some would say we don't need academic uh, discussion in the sense of uh, training the mind. All we need is neology, as one person put it. Be on our knees and learning from God on our knees. We don't need all these difficult talks. I would suggest that we 
uh, take uh, the great commandments seriously in Matthew 22, where the focus is not just on our the practical thing, but also on our mind. We are called to love the Lord our God with all our heart, with all our soul, and our mind, and our neighbor as ourselves. We should not be afraid to love God with our mind through an academic training that brings glory to His name, but also demonstrate love to our fellow human beings. I suggest, therefore, that our view of academic depth should be holistic in that it develop the whole person and not just his mind. This view on academic is grounded in something that is far more than our ability to reason. It is rooted in faith, our deepest inner conviction, which is to bring glory to God and to serve our fellow human beings. What we should do, I suggest, is that we train thinking practitioners. People who are able, uh, missionaries who are able to conduct independent missiological research, and preachers who are able to do independent exegesis of scripture. The one is not more important than the other. Yes, we do need mission practitioners, but we also need mission thinkers, people who are able to analyze the situation, not only describe, but also prescribe when necessary. The best thing would be to be there in the middle, to be able to be both a missionary and a missiologist. What, was, what must we do to build academic depth into our movement? I have a few suggestions. Why? Sorry. Why? It is because our world needed uh, more people in our days have access to higher education. We also have a generation of the Google generation. You say something while you're preaching, and some people are already online Googling what you're saying during your message. And also because people have the opportunity to go to the church next door if the preacher is boring. People are no longer committed to brethren because we are the only good uh, way of serving the Lord. I mean, that's what I've heard in the past, and that's how we feel it. There was a loyalty. You want to be there where the Lord is in the middle, where He is central. That's no longer there. You don't preach the word, right? People will know. Take it or leave. It was practiced throughout the history of the church that people were doing serious academic uh, studies and engage their community. I use the example here of William Kelly, who wrote a series of articles in the Bible Treasury on the known Isaiah, this debating the issue of whether uh, uh, Isaiah wrote the book of Isaiah or whether there was a Isaiah and a Deutero Isaiah and a Trino Isaiah. Those were written in his days engaging what was going on. There is also a lack in our movement today. I mean, some people will say we are a Bible-knowing group of believers. Uh, sometimes when you hear messages with a kind of over-allegorizing, not even able to support that kind of interpretation, it's not uh, something that you rejoice about. I think it's good to pay attention to hermeneutics. Uh, Looking at some of our conferences, I don't know if you know, but in some parts of the world they have conferences. And what were the themes? The Feast of Jehovah, the Servant of Jehovah, and not one on a biblical theological analysis of the emerging church, or the prosperity gospel, or church growth, engaging issues that are relevant to our day today. We keep going back to the writing of the early brethren. I don't say they are not good because I'm making use of them myself. But looking at it, you see, for example, William Kelly, who was able to, in, to interpret scripture in such a way, engaging views that were prevalent in his days. And I'm wondering, are we doing the same? Why should we do that? Luke did that. New Testament writers did that. 
Uh, when Luke wrote the Gospel under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, it did not prevent him to use sound academic practices in his day. I list a few of them there uh, for us. He acknowledged the existence and consulted narratives that were compiled by many before him. He worked only with reports that were built on the account of eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. He studied all these things closely for some time. He investigated everything from the beginning. He wrote an orderly account. The purpose was to give his reader certainty concerning the thing in which he was taught. And he did that for one man. What about us for all of God's people? How must we build academic depth into our movement? I have three more minutes and then I'll throw it open for the question. One is we have to model godly, crystal-centric, Holy Spirit-led academic leadership in churches. Yes, we want academics, but we really don't want academics who will put people to sleep during the sermons. We should not bore people with the Word of God. We should also consider offering multiple academic opportunities. Not everybody will be able to go to an institution of higher learning, but all of them need to be trained and formed. And of course, uh, as some of you may know, I'm passionate about taking education to the people with distance learning, including to our local churches. We are training for them and we should not become uh, estranged from them. We should, we should know them and we should be able to serve them well. And I think the previous speaker spoke about it as well. A curriculum in conversation with our students, our churches and our society. Let me close with this one. The tale told by John Beatty about an African who went to Europe, Germany to study theology. I have the whole story there on your slides that I'm just sharing. He went to Germany and he learned German, Greek, French, Latin, Hebrew, in addition to English, church history, systematic, homiletics, exegesis, and all these things, and studied for nine years and wrote a dissertation on someone, uh, a theologian of the Middle Ages, and he got his doctorate. And after almost 10 years, it was time for him to go home. And on his way home, he bought all the books that he uh, got there, uh, Bultmann, Bart, Bonhoeffer, uh, Brunner, uh, Buber, Kuhn, Kuhn, Moltmann, all of them he bought to take back to his home in Africa to teach his people. When he arrived, I mean the people rejoiced uh, with him, but then something happened. His sister fell to the ground, started manifesting, and he said, they, they, well, they were looking for him to to help and he said, let's take her to the hospital. He didn't realize that in his own context where he grew up, uh, that the nearest hospital was 50 miles away and there are few buses that go there. A boy was able to tell him that and someone told him, she is possessed. The hospital will not cure her. And of course, Having studied there for 10 years and all these theologians, he should be able to help his sister. So what, what did he do? So slowly he goes to Boltman, look at the index, find what he wants, read again about spirit possession in the New Testament. Of course, he got an answer. Boltman had demetrialized it. His sister, he insists that his sister is not possessed because according to Bootman, that does not happen anymore. Help your sister, they said. And he said, Bootman has demetrialized demon possession. <laughs> so his learning did not help him to serve well in his own community. Thank you. But I think there's just one course that I would like to suggest all brethren institutions should consider offering in that group. Do you know what that is? How to disagree gracefully. <laughs>